All right. Did you know that more neurons get activated in your brain when you walk than when you play a game of chess? You probably don't consciously think about it when you walk. Um, uh, but it turns out that uh, the mechanism of walking is extremely complex. As, as children, we learn to automate this mechanism by coordinating legs and arms and hips together with sensing our environment. And despite it seems really easy for us, it's, it's really not. So my question to you is, um, how would you build a, an AI system that could walk? The DARPA Robotics Challenge, these are images from back in 2015, was uh, motivated by the Fukushima disaster. The goal was to develop a mobile robot that could move through and within disaster zones and perform useful tasks, um, like uh, using power tools, opening doors, walking up the stairs, walking through the side. And like I said, as easy as it seems for us humans, it's, it's really not. And for an AI system, walking is extremely complex. And of course, at times, uh, things will go wrong. Now, some of these really hurt. Um, but the point is that designing such a complex system and provided with AI is by no means an, an easy thing to do. So inspired by this, and also the movie uh, How to Train Your Dragon, given that we're in a movie theater, uh, this talk is going to be titled How to Train Your Robot, in this case to walk with uh, deep reinforcement learning. Uh, I'm Lucas Garcia, I'm an application engineer at MathWorks, and for the last decade or so I've been working with and obsessed with what math can do for, for AI. I want to start by thanking some of my colleagues at MathWorks who have helped me uh, put together this material. And so let's start uh, discussing about what the goal of control is. So broadly speaking, the goal of a control system is to determine the right actions into the system that generate the desired system behavior. With uh, feedback control systems, the controller uh, observes such behavior and uses those state observations to improve its performance and correct for random disturbances and errors. And engineers typically use these feedback along with a model of the system or the plant, also known as environment, to design a controller that meets these uh, system requirements. All right, so this is a simple concept uh, to put into words, but it can be hard to achieve if the system is hard to model, like a walking robot, uh, is highly nonlinear, uh, like a walking robot, or has a large state or action spaces, like a walking robot. So let's think of this in the context of our walking robot. All right, so we're going to start thinking about the complexity of building um, a walking robot uh, from the traditional controls approach, so the way an engineer will traditionally do it. We'll start off by getting some data, some, some camera data, which, uh, so once we acquire those images, we can extract features, and then together with data coming from other sensors, we can um, complete the state estimation that then we can use together with a model of the system uh, to design the control system. And very likely, this control system will consist of multiple control loops that all interact with each other uh, to generate this complex mechanism of walking. And there could be maybe low-level controllers responsible for uh, the uh, actu actuators in the joints, or uh, higher-level controllers managing leg and trunk trajectories, or even higher-level controllers managing the balance. And all of these has to work together in an uncertain environment with all of these uh, loops interacting with each other. And it is not very clear um, how to structure these loops or how to break up the problem into parts. So imagine if we were able to squeeze everything down into a single black box controller that takes in observations as inputs and outputs the motor commands directly. 
So as an engineer, if you were to design such a controller, how would you do it? Well, the thing is, we're not going to design it. Uh, this is where machine learning comes in, and in particular, reinforcement learning. So what is reinforcement learning? Uh, well, first off, uh, my apologies to all of those for whom this is our review, but I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's important for, for context. So reinforcement learning is a subset in machine learning that learns from data coming from a dynamic environment. The goal is not to cluster or classify the data, but to find the best sequence of actions that generates the desired outcome. So of all the definitions out there, the one that I really uh, think that best describes what it is, is the one given by uh, Saturn and Barto in the reinforcement learning book. They describe it as learning how, what to do, how to map situations to actions so as to maximize a numerical reward signal. And continues with, the learner is not told which actions to take, but instead much, must discover which actions yield um, the most reward by trying them. As for applications, uh, reinforcement learning has been widely used and popularized with video games. Uh, I think you may have all heard of the company uh, DeepMind, who created the program AlphaGo. Uh, that was a computer program that could beat the world's best uh, Go players. And then, years after, they created AlphaStar, uh, a program that, or an AI that could beat the world's uh, top professional players at StarCraft II. But reinforcement learning has grown uh, today beyond video games in areas such as uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, we're seeing an example of autonomous vehicles using reinforcement learning uh, with the AWS's uh, Deep Racer competition. Or controls, maybe, to stabilize a drone in a highly dynamic and turbulent flow. Or even robotics uh, to teach a robot to walk. All right. so. Before diving any deeper, I want to review some deep learning terminology. So despite we're not a piece of software, um, unless maybe someone proves that we live in a simulation, but that's a different movie, uh, we learn in a similar way as software, a software agent learns. So this is our agent. Um, we're going to be thinking about our walking robots. So uh, we can think of the software running in a robot as the agent that operates in a specific environment, uh, moving uh, the robot joints, for instance, in order to walk. So the agent is able to, given a set of observations, uh, determine which actions uh, to take. And these are the outputs. And these functions that you see here that uh, maps uh, observations to actions, it's going to be called the policy. Then the agent is going to be rewarded by the environment by taking actions that are good, like staying upright, continue walking. And at the same time, it will get low or negative reward for taking actions that are bad, such as falling to the ground. So we're going to continue building our basic understanding on, of reinforcement learning with a reinforcement learning workflow. Um, so if we, we first need to choose an environment where our agent can learn. Uh, we need to define what should exist within this environment, and also whether it is a simulation or a real physical setup. We also need to figure out what we want our agent to do and craft a reward function that will incentivize the agent uh, to do just that. Then we're going to have to come up with a, a policy, so how to structure the logic and the parameters that make the decision-making part of the agent. Uh, we're going to be training our agent to figure out what the optimal policy is. And finally, we want to deploy the policy into the field, into the real robot, and test it. All right, so let's start with the environment then. Um, we're going to define the environment as everything that exists outside of the agent. It is where the agent sends actions to, and it, it is also what, what generates rewards and observations. Uh, for the context uh, of, our, of our example, we're going to be using uh, a simulation environment and, and not use the real robot. Um, and we'll touch upon uh, the reasons for doing that. But the agent is just going to be the piece of software that 
basically updates the policy and generates the actions. And it is going to be the brain of the robot, so to speak. All right, so we were, we were saying that uh, we're going to be using a simulation environment and not the real robot. And there's, there are a few good reasons for that. First off, uh, the, if we were using a real robot, it will very likely fall even, just, even before it starts to move its legs, and that'll be very expensive. And it will also be very time consuming to pick up the robot every time it falls. So uh, it makes sense to use a, a simulation environment. And this brings a couple of benefits. Uh, if we simulate the environment, we can run faster than real time. And this is going to be an, an interesting point, because we're going to have to run thousands and thousands of simulations. Also, we might have to run those simulations in parallel and speed up the training process. And finally, you would like to test for conditions that are uh, hard to test in the real world, but easy to test on a simulated environment, like maybe walking over ice. All right, so if we think of what the observations are going to look like, um, we're going to measure, using sensors, uh, the translation and rotation of the robot body, the joint angles of each, uh, or yeah, the joint angles of uh, each leg and, and their derivatives, and an indicator FR, FR and FL of the normal force uh, with respect to the ground to indicate whether that foot is in contact with the ground or not. With those measurements, then the agent will produce an action, which in our case uh, we've chosen to be the torques applied at each of the uh, joints of the robot's legs. Uh, at each time step, the environment will generate some, some kind of reward, and we'll get to choose that as a designer, so we'll look into that in just a minute. And now, the question is, how do we design uh, such an environment? Uh, there are multiple options out there, and in our case, we decided to use Simulink. So what is Simulink? Simulink is a block diagram environment for multi-domain simulation and model-based design. Uh, it provides a graphical editor together with uh, customizable block libraries and solvers that allow you to uh, simulate and model dynamic systems. The idea behind Simulink is that you will drag and drop the blocks that do the math of your model as if it was a whiteboard. Here we're seeing the Simulink model. You see a block for the RL agent and a block for a walking robot. This is our environment. We see that we have blocks representing the robot legs. We have blocks representing the sensors, the world underground. If you double-click in each of these blocks or subsystems, you get a more complex logic of how we build this robot leg. Same thing with the sensors that will then be transformed into the observations that will be fed by the agent. And, of course, the world and the ground where the robot is operating, this contains the physics underlying how a robot is, is moving uh, through, the, through the environment. So that was a brief uh, introduction to Simulink. Uh, I'd like now to discuss um, what the agent, or what the reward is. Um, so the reward is a function that outputs a scalar number that represents the goodness or the benefit of an agent being in a particular state and taking a particular action. So uh, creating a reward function is, is very, very easy. It's just a function of the state and the action. But creating a, re a good reward function, that is, that is very, very hard to achieve. Because unfortunately, there is no straight way to come up with an agent and a reward function and guarantee that the agent will converge to the solution you actually want. So let's see how we came up with the reward function for a walking robot. And you'll get to see the walking robot um, for the first time now. All right. So what do we want to accomplish? Uh, we want the robot to walk in a straight line and uh, walk straight, of course. We don't want the robot to fall. So we're going to craft this reward function uh, by using multiple terms. Um, first, we, instead of distance, we can reward the robot for its uh, forward velocity in the x-axis so that there is a desire in the robot to walk faster rather than walking slower. And with this reward function, 
after some training, this is what happens. So you see that the uh, robot quickly uh, fails to get that quick burst of, of speed, but doesn't really know how to use the, the joints. Um, all right, so what is it that we're getting here? What we're getting is a very common local minimum where the robot, uh, very early in the process, learns that by, by, by diving, it can maximize its forward moving reward. So how we can fix this? We can work around it by adding a duration reward or a survival reward so that the robot lasts longer. TF is the final simulation time, TS is the sample time. So by doing this and training again, uh, this is what happens. Robot takes a step and dives again. Uh, so we're not getting there yet. Uh, probably if, had we trained this agent for longer, uh, we could have gotten better results. But what it makes sense now is um, to add some sort of um, uh, reward term that helps to keep the robot as close to a standing height as, as possible. So what we're going to be doing is introducing a penalty term that uh, penalizes the robot uh, whenever there is a C displacement from a reference uh, in, in the height, uh, and that reference is C0. And now this here is looking a little bit better. Um, but as you can see, this is not very natural looking. The robot kind of jitters its leg back and forth, and it's kind of dragging the right leg as if it was injured or something. Um, so yeah, we have to work around this. Um, so how are we going to do it? Well, we're going to, do, uh, we're going to introduce another, another penalty term. And so we can reward the agent for minimizing actuator effort. Uh, so by doing so, uh, this gets uh, a more, let's say, realistic result. Uh, the robot is equally using now both legs. Um, and there's just one, one minor problem. And it is that we want a robot to be designed to work, walk straight. And as you can see, it's already diverting from the original path. Original path. So to fix this, we add the final uh, reward term, and that is um, to make sure that the robot uh, walks straight by introducing this penalty whenever there's uh, a drift or a stray from the y-axis. And this is going to be our final reward. So how do we integrate this with the uh, environment? Well, we're going to have a block here in, in, in Simulink, and I'm going to overlay now the, the equation that we came up with, or the, the function, and you can see that there is a direct correspondence between these blocks and each of these terms. Now, I didn't mention it earlier on, but uh, we could have used other tools for modeling the environment. Uh, we could have used MATLAB, of course, um, and uh, MATLAB provides an API, an nice API, to, to build up your, your environments and also has predefined environments. Or you could also have also used third-party uh, third environments and interface those uh, with, uh, with MATLAB. Right. Um, either way, in this, in this particular case, uh, because of the complex uh, modeling uh, underlying the walking robot, it made much, sense, much more sense to do it with a multi-domain uh, simulation environment. All right, so now that we have discussed the role of the environment and the reward, we're going to talk about the policy. And so uh, in order to do so, we must review in further detail what the agent really is. All right, so earlier on, the agent, which we described as, as the brain of the robot, is going to consist of two main parts, and that is the policy and the reinforcement learning algorithm. The policy is going to be a function that maps observations to actions, whereas the reinforcement learning algorithm is going to be the optimization method to uh, use to find the optimal policy. So the learning algorithm is going to change the policy based upon the actions that were taken, the observations from the environment, and the amount of reward that is collected. 
Uh, at the same time, the goal of the agent is to use these uh, reinforcement, reinforcement learning algorithms to, to modify its policy as, as it interacts with the environment so that the policy, given any state, it always chooses the best action. And the best action is the one that collects the most reward. All right, so of course during this talk we don't have time to go through every possible policy and and learning algorithm, so I'll just cut the chase and discuss the type of uh, policy functions that I'm interested in at this point, and those are neural networks, okay? So recall that the goal of the policy is to map observations to actions. So we can come up with a neural network and use it as a universal function approximator that takes in state observations as inputs and outputs the actions. All right. Um, this type of neural network is, is going to be called an actor, because it's going to be telling the, uh, the agent which actions to take, uh, given the current state. And here, I want to make an important distinction between, between two concepts in, in reinforcement learning, and that is the difference between reward and value. So earlier on, we described reward as the instantaneous benefit of being in a particular state and taking a particular action. Now, value is going to be the total reward that an agent expects to receive from a state and onwards into the future. And these two concepts are key, because um, if, if you're in a particular state, given any state, um, the what it means is that the, the action that collects the most reward from the current state is not necessarily the action that collects the most total reward in the long run. Right? So what this means is that somehow we have to check the value for every action from a given state in order to determine what the best action is. And so this network doesn't entirely solve the problem. And we're looking here for a second type of network. So this is going to take in uh, state observations and actions as inputs, and the neural network will return the value of that state action pair. And the policy is to choose the action with the highest value. This network is going to be called a critic, because it's going to be criticizing the uh, agent's choices by looking at the actions, at possible actions. However, uh, this setup does not, well work, does not work well either, and uh, the reason for that is that how could you possibly try every possible action out there um, and find the maximum value or find the action with the maximum value, even for large uh, state uh, spaces or large state actions, it's, it's very computationally very expensive. So the way we're going to solve this problem is by merging together both networks in a class of algorithms called actor critic. And so this is how it works. So first, the actor is a network trying to predict an action given the current state. And then the critic is a second network that will estimate the value of that state action pair. And that is the state and action, or the action that the actor took. Now, this one works well for continuous action spaces because the critic does not have to look into an infinite number of actions, but just one, the, the one that the actor took. And so it does not have to find the best action by evaluating all of them. All right, so um, let's see how this works in practice. Um, and uh, so to do so, the critic is going to use the reward from the environment to determine the accuracy of its value prediction. Once we have that error, the error is going to be used to update the critic so that it has a better estimate the next time it's in that state. And the actor is going to also update itself with a response from the critic so it adjusts probabilities of taking that action again in the future. And now the policy ascends the reward slope in the direction that the critic recommends rather than using the rewards directly. So this is how we solve it in MATLAB. Uh, we first start by defining these networks, the critic network, by just concatenating layers. And this can be rel layers, fully connected layers, tanh layers. We do the same for the actor. And 
There's, of course, this, this API that allows you to, to put this together. It's very straightforward. And once we're done, we create also an, uh, an RL representation, a reinforcement learning representation, which means we're putting together the environment and the network. Uh, we run this, and now I want to show you how you could have done this interactively, so that you have a feeling of what it's looked like to do this um, in the interactive environment. So this is a Deep Network Designer, and here you can drag and drop layers into the canvas to build your, to build your network, but I'm just importing the critic network so that you have a feeling of what it looks like. And what you see here is that you can just click in each of these layers, and, and you have on the right-hand side I, all the properties for each layer. You see the two branches, the uh, observation branch and the action branch, and they get merged together uh, to produce the final uh, output of the critic network. Now, had you done this interactively instead of programmatically, you could, have, you could export the generated code and use that as part of your algorithm or your program. All right, so once we're done um, crafting or uh, the reward, um, de determining what, what the environment should consist of, uh, what the policy should look like, then we can train the agent. Now, training um, is going to be a little tricky because it's, be, it's going to involve running lots and lots of simulations. And by lots, we mean in the order of thousands, of uh, dozens of thousands. Um, so it's going to be key being able to run those simulations in, in a parallel manner, uh, whether that's a compute a cluster or just a local um, multi-core machine or the cloud. And when training with parallel computing, uh, also working out the agent and environment is a little tricky. So this is how it works. The client is going to send copies of the agent and environment to the workers, to the parallel workers doing the job. And each, each worker is going to get its uh, simulation uh, uh, data. It's going to uh, train and it's going to send the data back to the host. The agent is going to learn, or the client agent in this case, is going to learn from the parameters sent by the workers and is going to send the uh, updated policy data back to the workers, and, and then learning continues. Uh, also, if you're using deep neural network for your actor or critic representations, it's worth using GPUs, as, as you probably know already. And so this is how it works in, back in the MATLAB environment. First, we have some training options that we can choose from uh, for the agent and, and for hyperparameters for the training. Here, we're choosing a maximum number of episodes of 5,000. Um, we're also using a stopping, stopping criteria of reaching 120 reward or greater, so whatever comes first. Um, uh, then here, we're seeing uh, how to configure the environment. Uh, configure the networks or create the architectures and then train it. Uh, as we train, we're also going to have some saving criteria, so any agent that is over 150 reward will be saved for, for inspection later. And here you see the reinforcement learning episode manager. You see the training as it progresses. We're training on two workers and one GPU, so it's a local machine. And the curves represent the, the red uh, is the moving average, uh, the blue is the uh, simulation uh, reward, and then the, the uh, green one, which is labeled by episode, episode Q0, represents the initial value that the critic estimates for, for that simulation. Uh, as you'll see, the stopping criteria is going to be reaching either uh, 120 reward or uh, reaching 5,000 simulations or episodes, whatever comes first. The algorithm that we're using, the reinforcement learning algorithm, is called DDPG, or Deep Deterministic Policy Gradient. And this is known to be as a high variance algorithm. And what that means is that the reward function isn't guaranteed to keep increasing monotonically as, as the training continues. So we have to watch out for it. And uh, here we are seeing the result of one of the agents that we saved, one of the agents that reached uh, 150 reward or more. And we're seeing that the robot walks pretty stable, pretty stable, and it moves its uh, right and le left leg quite quite efficiently. All right. So once we're done, uh, we want to deploy, and uh, to do so, uh, we need to think about um, what we just did. We we were training in an offline uh, in an offline manner. Uh, by using a simulated environment. So now what we want to do is to deploy the policy off to the target hardware. 
And for doing so, uh, we don't want to recode the, the policy in another language, because that will be very time consuming and very error prone. So we're going to be automatically generating C code or, or CUDA code from the policy that we have trained or the agent that we have trained and then run it on the embedded system. Uh, so, and here um, you see that uh, we are uh, generating uh, a function that we can then deploy. And when you, we open up this function, this contains uh, a reference to a file called agentdata.mat that has the network uh, parameters of the actor network that is going to be deployed. Uh, we are going to open up a tool for uh, code generation. This is called uh, GPU Coder. And we provide an entry point to, uh, to, the, to the app. And here next, we're going to have to do something which is uh, obvious, and it's define the input uh, data types. C and CUDA are strongly typed as opposed to MATLAB. So we need to now tell the tool how, how it must generate code for us. So it, in this case, it's going to be a double array of 31 by 1. Uh, here we can check for runtime errors. We're going to skip this for now. Um, and then we can choose wh what type of code we want to generate. For, uh, want to generate. Here we're just choosing m uh, the host computer, so for whatever CPU and GPU that uh, computer has. But we could have also targeted uh, NVIDIA embedded systems, like the NVIDIA Jetson or NVIDIA Drive. And uh, once we're done with the code generation part, uh, you get uh, a nice uh, report that you can look at. And one, uh, in here, one of the things that I really like is how you can trace code between the original MATLAB code and the automatically generated uh, uh, CUDA code uh, so that you can determine that, for instance, here, the predict function corresponds to deep learning network underscore predict. And you can look for that in the source files that have been generated and uh, see how memory copies are uh, being managed between the host and the device, so between the CPU and the GPU. All right. All right, so we covered a lot today, and I want to finish off with some key takeaways. Um, at first, we saw how reinforcement learning can solve complicated problems, and we saw this in the context of controls and robotics for building a robot that could walk. Uh, now, important thing is that reinforcement learning can uh, be applied to many, many other fields. Uh, you just need to determine whether it's the right approach versus other alternatives. Uh, we saw that deep neural networks can handle large uh, or continuous or high dimensional uh, state and action spaces with the actor and our critic network. And we also uh, show a complete workflow of, for deep reinforcement learning with, with MATLAB and Simulink. Now, if you want to play with this, uh, all the code for the environment, the agents, everything is available on our, on our GitHub site. And you can also access a license, uh, try a license for, for MATLAB so that you can uh, use those, uh, uh, those files. And finally, if, um, if you can wait to play with it, because uh, you're, you're, you're stuck here at the conference, uh, feel free to come by the booth and, uh, and play with it, play with the rewards, play with the environment. And uh, before I finish, I want to end with um, one example from uh, one of our customers. And so I would like to introduce you to uh, Justin. Uh, so Justin is a humanoid robot developed by the DLR. DLR is the German Aerospace Center. It has up to 53 degrees of freedom, uh, which allow it to almost match human performance for, for many activities. Um, now, humanoid robots like Justin um, need to process inputs coming from a wide variety of, uh, of senses, uh, plan trajectories, manage the coordinated movement of dozens of joints uh, at the same time. Uh, the DLR used MATLAB and, and Simulink to uh, design prototype their algorithms and test them on, on, the, real, uh, on the real hardware uh, in Justin by generating optimized C code in this case that could run in Justin's real-time operating system. And uh, what this allowed them to do is to reduce the amount of, the amount of time it takes uh, to bring the code to production uh, from weeks that they would need for manual coding down to just a few hours. Now, nonlinear optimization algorithms are used for planning to maximize, for instance, the, just, the distance that Justin can, can throw the ball, as we were seeing in the video, and uh, perform coordinated motions from the cameras to the fingertips. 
And so uh, this is another area where math and optimization, like it is the case with deep, deep reinforcement learning, uh, play a big role in enhancing AI systems. So these are uh, some of the areas uh, I find more and more inspiring. So what will your next AI look like? Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, who has questions? I thought you were going to make it e sound easy to build a robot. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea what I was looking at. But uh, any questions for Lucas about uh, how to build a dragon? No, how to build a robot. I can't see any. Um, OK, well, I, I do have one question. Hmm? Uh, when we think about the robots of the future, what are we going to see in 10, 20, 30 years? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, yeah, so we, we're already seeing a lot of amazing uh, maneuvers by the um, uh, by many companies. Boston Dynamics is mm -hmm. one of them. Uh, you may have uh, probably seen some of the robots doing very weird parkour things. And, yeah. uh, so what I think is that more and more we'll get used to um, uh, having robots as part of uh, uh, the interactions that we have. Uh, so maybe robots that will assist um, elderly in, uh -huh. in, their, in their houses. Or, uh, that, is, that is, I think, the area where, I, where, where probably we're going to get there first. Okay. And then as technology evolves and we are able to solve more complex problems, who knows? Okay, and and a, and a legacy question for you. What was the name? I had the robot with the original 8-bit Nintendo. What was he called or she? Do you remember? I don't recall. Does that. anyone know? Neo, maybe. Neo. I don't know. I don't know. That yeah. couldn't do much. It never worked. I always never had any fresh <laughs> batteries or something. Um, great. Well, thank you, Lucas. Thank you very much. Cheers.